All right, folks, check out our uh, YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, help us grow by contributing $2 a month at www.patreon.com slash Mike and Maurice. You will get access to exclusive interviews and videos. Visit our website at Mike and Maurice MindEscape.com. Uh, you can also follow us uh, at, on Instagram at Mike underscore N underscore Maurice. Uh, follow us on Twitter at Mike Escape. Uh, join our YouTube pages as well. We are uh, Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape uh, on Facebook. And you can also check out our other page, Ancient Secrets. Boom. What's up, Maurice? How are you doing? Good, good. How are you, my man? Good. We have uh, today is uh, Easter Island Part 2, Alternative Theories and Mysteries. Uh, it's episode 83. And uh, we're going to be going through the second part um, of what, you know, we did episode one was the mainstream theories and like the more of the academic theories. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, we're going to be going through more of the, you know, the alternative stuff. Like the fun stuff. Yeah, the mysteries, the stuff that people, some people would consider pseudoscience or fringe or whatever you want to say. Um, but we'll start the stuff with stuff we like to look at, though. We like to expand the mind. That's why we call it mind escape. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, we'll get into some of the crazier ideas as well, but that'll be towards <laughs> hey! the end. We'll start with more of the probable ones and our work our way to the more of the non probable Zany. ones. Okay. So, um, just to give you a little overview, um, you know episode one we went through like the whole history and everything i'll just give you a, a little recap on that uh easter island is 64 square miles uh it's one of the more remote islands on the planet um the pitcairn islands are about 1200 miles to the west the juan fernandez islands are about 17 1800 miles to the east um and the closest continental uh, point to Easter Island is its home country of Chile, which is about like uh, 2,300 miles. Um, we'll go here. So we talked about this on the first one, but m the, the mainstream theory about how people initially got there is roughly 1000 BC, the indigenous people of the Philippines and Indonesia and uh, s southern parts of Asia started migrating east. Um, some of them, you know, landed in Micronesia, some of them went to Melanesia, um, and some of them kept going all the way to Polynesia. Um, Polynesia is a subregion of, uh, Oceania. And, um, so you see there, um, on the, uh, the map, kind of the different little, uh, you got Micronesia up top, Melanesia, and then Polynesia, uh, That's to the right. professional, my friend. Yeah. You know, I put a little PowerPoint presentation right. together you know put a little work into it you know I, I figured when you and i are going to do the episodes alone we're not interviewing people i thought i'd take it up another lot another notch here so yeah, um, anything not to look at our ugly faces exactly um but yeah you see a little diagram there you know i think um you know it makes sense from that regard but look at how far from you know melanesia uh, in Micronesia, how far people are traveling east, you know, and actually yeah. Chile's closer on the west side to Easter Island. So it's, you know, we'll, we're going to get into that here in a second, but um, it's interesting that it's such a, a commonplace theory that they traveled that way east, but then nobody really talks about it coming from the other way from the west from south america which i will get into and why that actually might be the case so well what do you know about the like the, the way that the winds blow and stuff maybe it was just harder to travel that direction that's a good point um but here i'll pull this up here because um, there are canals that run through the oceans right channels you can get into and flow through flow down okay so well I don't know about how, how the winds work specifically towards that, but we're going to talk about Thor Heyerdahl in a minute. And this guy built a raft and, uh, with natural um, plants and in, 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 uh, materials found in Chile or uh, Peru and was able to sail past even where Easter Island was, you know, so. Nice. Now that's, in, that's, uh, so, that's and innovation, that, baby. Okay, so the Rapa Nui people 
they think migrated from like we talked about the Polynesian islands, um, you know, as early as three to 400 AD. And most scientists will push that date all the way up to as recent as 1200 AD. Um, Originally, we talked about this before, they brought pigs, dogs, seeds, roots, uh, and they think rats were either brought or possibly hitched a ride. Um, Yeah, they just somehow always pop up. um, And they believe that the rats actually might have had a hand in depleting the resources on the island from eating the the palm nuts from the palm trees. Um, But they also think that people eating the migratory birds into extinction had had a factor on that. you know, we talked about by 1400 A.D., uh, there were no more, pal- no more palm trees left on the island, and Professor John Flenley suggested that it was the clearest example of uh, deforestation in the world that we have recorded. So, um, That's a shame. They most likely, the people trapped themselves on the island by deforesting it, eating all the migratory birds, um, and messing up the ecosystem to the point where things weren't growing back, things weren't replenishing. Um, and, and also, if they chopped down all the trees, they no longer would be able to build canoes to get off the island. Um, right. They literally couldn't escape because they used the resources that would allow them to get off. Right. Um, the first recorded visitor uh, was the Dutch explorer named Jakob Ragavine. He arrived on Easter uh, Sunday, April 5th, 1972, hence the name Easter Island. So that's just a little bit of background on the island. Like I said, I just wanted to do a little recap on that stuff before we start getting into some of the crazier stuff. Um, I wonder what they called it before Jakob showed up. Jakob. Um, there is a name. I can't pronounce it, but it means like, yada, yada, yada. like center of the the world or belly of the world something along navel of the world i think something oh, i like that That's interesting uh so the origin story of the island goes um and that's a picture of ahu akivi which we'll talk about um in a little bit but those are the only seven moai on the island that face outward towards the sea all the other moai faced inward so uh I've, uh the seven moai right there represent King Hotu Matua's seven scouts. And as the legend goes, Haumaka, this guy, had a dream of an island called, um, you know, the center of the earth or, you know, Easter Island. Uh, when he woke from his dream, uh, he told King Hot- Hotu Matua of this mythical, uh, um, you know, land. King Hotu Matua sent his seven scouts from Hiva, uh, which is a Possibly, they think, modern-day Marquesas Islands, which are kind of, you know, out there in in the the Pacific Ocean, not too far. Um, The seven scouts found the island uh, and then returned to Hiva um, and brought the king back to his new home, which was Easter Island. So they think that was the origin of, you know, the Polynesian or Rapa Nui people on the island. Okay... So we're going to go to episode, or the next slide here. Let's get into the knit grit. It's getting down to the nitty gritty. Let's get this show. But don't on don't there. make a mistake. Be careful with these controls here. You're already No, stuff it's just the, develop here. I hit the wrong button by accident. All right. Uh so the Moai represent the deified ancestors of the Rapa Nui people. Um they thought that the dead ancestors had a symbolic relationship with the living and they would assist them, you know, the living with things that they would need in life. Um, and in return, uh, by doing those deeds, they would secure themselves a better place in the spiritual realm, um, which kind of makes sense if you're a spiritual or religious person in that regard. Uh, almost all the, uh, like I said before, almost all the Moai face inwards to observe their descendants while keeping their backs to the spiritual realm. Um, the Ahu are those stone platforms that most of the Moai are sitting on top of. Um, most of the uh, Ahu are found along the coast. Out of the, um, the 313 of them, only 125 held Moai. And actually, Ahu's are found in other Polynesian islands. I, th- I don't know if there's some on Hawaii, but I know other Polynesian islands have them. So it's obviously something, you know, that was a big part of their culture. Yeah. 
So here's just a diagram that I showed before in the last episode, but it's just the basic anatomy of a, a moai. This is from Ahu Tahai. Um, you know, the, the top knot, which is the, uh, the red hat, some people think it represents like hair pulled up into some sort of like a, you know, man bun style thing. Some people, <laughs> some people believe it's, you know, was an actual hat. You know, some people it's some sort of symbolism, uh, but it's called a top knot or pukau. Uh, it's made from red scoria, which is a type of stone found on the island. Um, they, uh, the inside eyes are made from coral. They believe it like crushed up coral. Um, to give it that white color. Um, the bodies on most of the Moai are made from volcanic tuff, which uh, was from the, the, we'll get to it, but there's a quarry on the island uh, where they still have some Moai that are stuck in the quarry. So they know for sure that that's where they came from. And obviously based on the stone and everything. Uh, and again, there's the Ahu that it's standing on, which is the altar. So yeah, that's just the basic, um, you know, structure of, of one of these Moai and Ahu and everything. So let's go to the next one. All right, so here's where we start getting to some of the alternative uh, theory stuff. So um, Thor Heyerdahl, uh, he was a Norwegian uh, ethnographer. Um, he also had a background in geography, botany, and zoology. Um, He's most famous for his Kontiki uh, expedition, which was in 1947. We talked about that. I brought that up a little bit earlier, uh, where him, he and his team built a raft using materials that were native to, you know, the coast of South America, um, you know, reeds and, and different, you know, materials. Uh, they, they sailed actually 5,000 miles uh, from Peru to the Tuamotu Islands in uh, French Polynesia, which is not, I mean, it's not close, but it's not that far from Easter Island. Um, you know, this expedition basically proved that ancient and primitive people could have probably been able to make their way around, you know, uh, longer sea voyages than previously thought. You know, like, I, I, I think... The thought is with most academics is that a lot of these primitive people didn't get around, but we know the Egyptians built boats. We know that the Vikings were avid seafaring people. You know, we know that, um, you know, the Australian people used canoes and, and dugouts and different things, you know? Um, so, you know, we know that people were building boats and getting around. So this kind of was just an exercise, uh, to prove the point that, hey, this is possible, we did it. Uh, also, they used, um, I think, uh, drawings of, um, they, they, they did research on like the conquistadors when they came over, what they found or what they were describing. So they tried to recreate what, what was possible at that time, you know, back then and what people possibly were using to get around. Um, he based the name of the expedition on the Incan and pre-Incan god, Kontiki Viracocha. Um, Viracocha is pretty, pretty, you know, um, you, you I, I know Graham Hancock talks a lot about him in Fingerprints of the Gods and Magician of the Gods. Um, he supposedly brought, you know, he's like the god of everything basically, but he taught the people in South America, you know, animal husbandry and agriculture, um, you know, not to sacrifice people. So he was like, you know, a teacher in that way. Uh, the, the name Viracocha translates to foam of the sea, um, which I think is somewhat relevant to all this. Um, you know, the, the film there, they actually made a documentary about this Contiki expedition. Um, in 1951 yeah 1951 uh and it won an academy award for best documentary which is kind of interesting um i have i try and check that yeah i haven't watched it i gotta check that out though myself um let's see here he also he organized an archaeological expedition to easter island in 1955 um his team of scientists and archaeologists studying you know they studied the carving methods and the possible way that the the moai were transported around the island uh they were also allowed to do a lot of digging and stuff that you're currently not allowed to do um they did find some weird pit and walls um uh, around certain parts of the island that 
you know, are no longer, I don't want to say there, but you know, they're no longer, you can't just go there and dig anymore. Obviously there's a lot of protocol with that kind of stuff. Um, he also wrote a book, uh, Easter Island, the mystery solved where he claims, um, or, you know, Easter Island was originally colonized by South Americans and not Polynesians. Um, he believes that these people were known as the Hanau, uh, Hanau Epe, which meant long ears. Um, and to back that up, in 1972, Dutch Admiral Jakob Ragavin reported finding white Indian and Polynesian people all living in harmony when he got to the island. Um, and then something happened between then and when James Cook, who was an explorer, got to the island in 1774, um, James Cook found a much smaller population con uh, consisting mainly of uh, the Hanau Momoko, which uh, means short ears or basically the Polynesian people. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, and also Thor Heyerdahl points to uh, the oral tradition that talks about how the Hanau Momoko, the short ears, which were the Polynesian people, rose up against the ruling people at the time were the Hanau Epe, which were the long ears or the people from South America. So his theory was that, you know, the South Americans, maybe they were there first, maybe they also came across, maybe there was a bunch of different people coming there, you know? So um, his theory wasn't, it's not so cut and dry that they were all just Polynesian people traveling East from uh, Indonesia and stuff. So um, also, uh, the recent DNA research on, on some of the Rapa Nui people suggests a breakdown of, okay, so that says there's 76% Polynesian, 16% European, and 8% South American. So obviously the 76% Polynesian um, points to kind of what we were talking about, all the people traveling from you know, Micronesia, Melanesia, all that traveling yeah. east. Um, and then they, they tribute the 16% European, obviously, to when the Europeans came over um, and created the slave trade and also, I'm sure, did terrible things on the island. Yes, um, yes. And then, but they also, when they studied the 8%, uh, the South American genes, um, they found that the, the genes of the South, Amer the, uh, the South American genetics were from a much older date. So there might be something to Thor Heyerdahl's theory that maybe the original people were from South America, or maybe there was some sort of, you know, is you know we we saw obviously people came from the east. Why not people coming from the west, which is actually closer? So um, that's not that crazy of a theory. Um, that's the boat that Thor hired. That's uh, from the Kentucky expedition. So that was all the stuff that they used, which kind of you know it looks like something built in ancient times. It looks like something you would find. Um, you know, ancient South America, or even looks like something that could be ancient Middle Eastern in, in a certain light here. Um, so that's pretty interesting. And again, that boat right there sailed 5,000 miles across the ocean, which is pretty crazy. That thing looks like a basket. <laughs> yeah. A massive basket. I mean, they wove reeds together, um... And that, that thing floats? That's insane. Yeah. So there's that. Okay. So it's like beautiful, I was... beautiful, though. It's a nice piece of art, that's for sure. Yeah. So like I was talking about before, the Hanau Epe, long ears possibly uh, of Peruvian or South American descent, were defeated by the Hanau Momoko. The short ears, which are the people from Polynesia... Um, it's believed that there was a great battle fought sometime between the 16th and 18th centuries where the, um, you know, the people from South America were defeated by the people from, uh, Polynesia. Also, there are some, um, differences in some of the Moai that were carved, uh, the way they look, uh, the type of stone that was used. So we'll get into a little bit, a little bit of that later. Okay. Um, what do you think when you, um, when you think that people were traveling across, you know, long distances of, uh, of the, you know, the ocean back then, do you, you know, it just makes you wonder, like we think of people so primitively, 
you know, or that we think that they were so primitive back then that there's no way that they could have done something, you know, like that. Yeah, um, you gotta have supplies. You gotta be ready for the storms. Right. You have to have a knowledge of the sea, really. So. Right. There's some kind of documentation of or, or word of mouth. And you, know? you and you just gotta take that chance too. You know, you gotta make that leap. I think back right. then people were pretty fearless. You know, they saw. Well, the, I'm I'm saying that a couple of the groups probably went out and didn't succeed, but then there was past there was knowledge passed down that you gotta do this or do that to get to you know past the storm or right. I don't know. To, to, to make that reed boat, I'm sure the first reed boat didn't float too good. Right. So it, it was multiple generations of, again, it's the same thing in, in today's society. You, you learn from your dad how to, how to you know, paint or whatever. You just get a little bit better each time, and you teach your son the tricks. Did your dad teach you how to paint? Well, daddy wasn't there, <laughs> but that's a whole other... Are we, are we, All right, Austin. Po- coming on anytime soon? <laughs> All right, Austin Powers. <laughs> All right. Um, so this brings us to the, you know, another, more of the modern day alternative theory, which is the Dr. Anthony Parrott and Dr. Uh, well, hold on a second. I don't really understand. What's the theory? What do you mean theory? How people got there? How people got there. So the last one was how people could have gotten there. So right. the theory that people either sailed there from Polynesia or took canoes or boats or so whatever. To sum this up, there was a there was a race of people there that were very very old, and no one really understands right. how they either a sailed there. There's no way there's a land bridge. And there's different timelines of the cult. So you have the Moai cult. Okay, okay. You have the Moai cult, which are the people that built the Moai statues, and then later on you have the the Tengatu Manu, which is the Birdman cult, which was more predicated on a kind of a little bit of a different mythology. Um, and we'll get into that, but yeah, that was just basically how those who were the first people there, how did they get there, kind of a thing. Um, this theory is a little bit of that mixed with a little bit of um, you know stuff that you find around the island and correlating to other you know megalithic structures as well. So, uh-huh. all right, so this is Dr. Anthony Parrott um, and Dr. Robert Schock's plasma discharge theories. So. Uh, Dr. Anthony Parrott is an American physicist specializing in plasma physics and nuclear fusion. Uh, he has a PhD in electrical engineering and plasma physics. He also worked at Los Alamos uh, nuclear facility. Um, Dr. Parrott h- hypothesizes that the stickmen petroglyphs that you find around the world, you know, they're all over the world, uh, that maybe there's some connection to that and an ancient mass coronal ejection. Um, you know, that created intense plasma dis- discharges on the earth and its atmosphere. So uh, examples of that modern day, you know, like the Northern Lights, Aurora Borealis, uh, severe lightning, you know, stuff like that. Think Those are all pl- different types of plasma. But his theory is sometime during ancient times, there was stuff happening where, um, you know, it was unpleasant to be on earth from, you know, anywhere from radiation poisoning to, uh, constant lightning storms to, you know, um, weird stuff in the sky that they were experiencing. Um, you know, and, and he thinks that these, this phenomena resembled, you know, different things from like stick men figures to donut shapes to, um, other stuff that you found, you know, you, that you'll find in some artwork throughout antiquity. Um, so that's his theory. And, and um, Dr. Robert Schock, who's a little bit famous within the uh, alternative, you know, archaeology, you know, community, he uh, he was connected to, you know, John Anthony West and Graham Hancock and all those guys. Um, he wrote a book called Forgotten Civilizations. Uh, where he correlates, you know, Easter Island to Gobekli Tepe uh, and the redating of the Sphinx. Um, And basically, okay, so Dr. Robert Schock is an American uh, geologist uh, with a PhD in geology and geophysics from Yale. Uh, He is a professor at Boston University. He also has a degree in anthropology. Um, So, you know, he's got decent uh, credentials. Dr. Schock also connects Dr. Peratt's plasma discharge theory uh, to the end of the Younger Dryas era around 9700 BC. 
so where Graham Hancock, Randall Carlson, and all those guys are, you know, and, um, you know, like we had George Howard on our podcast, and, uh, you know, while all those guys, you know, put forward the theory or the common impact theory, which there was a comet or an asteroid or some large body from the Torrid meteor stream uh, that ended the last uh, ice age or the, at the end of the Younger Dryas that, that heated up the earth and melted all the glaciers. Robert Schock's theory is that this coronal mass ejection is what caused all that. So, you know, he's saying that the sun and its activity had more of an effect. He doesn't, you know, he used to subscribe, I think, to the the comet impact theory before he now believes that this is more probable, that there was some sort of, um, you know, sun, you know, related incident, you know, in ancient times that would have caused all this stuff relating it to, uh, Dr. Peratt's, you know, plasma, um, experiments and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, in his book, um, Forgotten Civilization, he, you know, makes connections between Easter Island's Rongo Rongo script and Dr. Peratt's Stickmen petroglyphs, um, suggesting an older origin date of Easter Island. Now he pushes it all the way back to kind of go back to Tepe. So like 9,700 BC. Um, I think that's a little far. <laughs> I think it's way far. Um, I, I'm not saying it's, it's, what do we know? You know, we don't know anything a hundred percent, but, um, just through like oral traditions and stuff that I've looked into and studied, I think that it, it would, it, it's a big stretch to go from three to 400 AD, which is being generous to 9,700 BC. I mean, I just think that that's a huge stretch, but we'll get into it here. Uh, he also makes connections between Gobekli Tepe and Easter Island. Uh, he's probably most well known for, you know, most people know him for redating the Sphinx to an older timeline, you know, based on the vertical water erosion uh, around the base of the Sphinx, um, suggesting at some point uh, there was a lot of rainfall or pros- possibly a different climate maybe. Um, so, yeah, th- that's the, the background on those two guys. So here's a diagram um, of what what happens during some of these coronal mass ejections or solar storms. Um, our Earth is prote- uh, protected, um, you know, by our magnetosphere and um, and magneto. <laughs> uh, but our our the Earth's the X Men. Yeah, you know, like everybody's like you know talks about when they talk about the moon landing there's the van allen radiation belt um right right you know and you've got you know so there's all sorts of different components that you know we can't see you know like the solar wind um the 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 the, the, the particles you know that that come in and basically it's kind of a super complex system the way that the earth um oh, yeah protects oh, us yeah protects us you know our atmosphere and and, and our magnetosphere uh protect us from these crazy things that the sun does on a regular basis um so without you know our atmosphere and all that stuff we would be in bad shape um you know the sun's just a beast and uh right now it's stable for us you know but i mean the <laughs> not I- for long <laughs> but the idea i mean we're nothing in, you know in the in the period of you know the or in, right, in the right, timeline yeah. of the universe a we're nothing yeah. not not even a tiny blip we're, we're nothing you know um yeah. <laughs> so when you think about it like that it's like there is a possibility that maybe the earth wasn't as stable as it you know is now back then in ancient times. I mean, we're talking, well, if you want to go back to like Gobekli Tepe, that's a long time ago. That's 11,700 years ago. So that's super long ago. But if you even want to go back to like ancient Egyptian, ancient Sumerian, you know, 3,500 BC or, you know, 3,000 uh, BC, 3,500 BC, the very earliest. Um, I mean, that's even a long time ago, you know, 5,500, 6,000 years ago. So, I mean, that's a yeah. long, that's a long time considering, you know, we only conceptualize, you know, back to what, 1700, the founding fathers, that kind of stuff. I mean, even back then, like we think about it and it's, it's weird to think about that, um, in the sense of lots li- of mist. 
well, just information well, translated. Not only that, but just living in that time in that era, you know, it's just not, you know, you th- you you would you look back at it and you think, wow, that probably wasn't the most pleasant. Obviously, with a lot of things that we know now and right. social aspects and all sorts of different things. So, but yeah, I mean, this is just a, a diagram, kind of outlining, you know, how where our Earth is and you know, relationship to all these. Um, you know, plasma discharges and the particles and the stuff that protects us and the solar winds and all that stuff. So, yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool. All right. So here's uh, some pics of some geomagnetic storms caused by uh, coronal mass ejections. Um, Coronal mass ejections cause the the plasma phenomenon, you know, like I said earlier, that we know as auroras, the northern lights, the southern lights, and lightning. Um, so imagine, you know, that Good topic because I think you could see the northern lights a couple of week, like a week ago. Yeah, I didn't from- see them because it was super sketchy weather wise here in Chicago. It was super overcast; you couldn't see anything. But yeah, I believe actually till like the mid there was the line went through the middle of Michigan, I believe. So maybe, yeah, maybe I've you- seen them in Lexington. That's where you could see them. You have to just go where there's not as much light. Right. So yeah, I mean. It, um, now t- times that times a million or, <laughs> you know times a billion or whatever and that's kind of what they're talking about when it comes to this stuff um you know when you look at the northern lights they're beautiful but imagine something more overbearing or something you know like constant lightning raining down or constant this or constant you know constant um radiation you know they think that in ancient times we found a lot of cave systems in turkey um there's a lot of uh um actually there's cave systems found on easter island too where um they think people might have gone for cover uh mainstream academics point to that's where people were hiding out during battles and wars or possibly looking for protection uh i know dr shock believes that those caves were used to protect the people from, you know, radiation and lightning storms and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of interesting. Dr. Shaq sounds like a Motley Crue song. <laughs> I like how he spells his name, though. Yeah. All right. So on the left, you have the Rongo Rongo script, which are a couple characters from that, um, which is the Easter Island or the Rapa Nui people's uh, writing system. Um, it's kind of like uh, hieroglyphs in a way. Um, they would write them on these wood tablets, which eventually the Catholic Church, when the Europeans came, burned most of them because um, they thought they were demonic, satanic, whatever. And uh, so a lot of their history has been erased, stuff that was written down for a long time, uh, stuff that was recorded. That's why you probably have a lot of people still questioning and and looking through Easter Island today for um, to figure out some certainties because you know I'm sure a lot of the stuff that was written down that was recorded that would have answered a lot of those questions is now gone Um, Dr. Shock's connection um, he basically like I said before Dr. Uh, Anthony Peratt has the the um, the plasma theory, which he actually produced these images through these plasma tests. Um, and you see there on the right, you see that the, the purple, uh, plasma thing. Mm -hmm. So you have that, that's actually, um, what, what kind of the image that they came out of. And he, so he just highlighted the lines of it and that's kind of what you get. And then you see, um, to the right of that and below that you see all these stick men found all over the world from Arizona to Armenia to, you know, um, the Alps, you know, Italy. Yeah. That, that line with those two dots is it's found all over the place. And I was watching this documentary. They were talking about how some tribes think it's like energy on one side. And then on the other side, it's actually like physical forms so like that line in between is the whatever you pass in between when you turn from energy into an actual solid whatever. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. 
that kind of... I don't know if I explained it the right way, but... Well, it kind of goes into, you know, like Laird Scranton's work with the the work of the ancient symbology that he's found connecting, you know, the material and the non-material world, and there's this division between, and sometimes the the two realms get close together, um, where you have, like, a golden age and stuff like that, so that's... So that's yeah, that's interesting. Um, I could buy into something along those lines. Is, is I part. thought it was really cool. Yeah, because it's like you know, embracing the thought of you know, whatever you are might just be. It's not in a solid form. It's either energy. It, well, it is energy. I don't right. know how else to really explain it, but and right. then you, you you go back and forth. So then when you pass away, you turn back into whatever that thing may be, and then you would be pumped back into something else later. Right. Whether that be another animal on this planet or a whole new dimension altogether. <laughs> um, so, but on the left, you have the Rongo Rongo figures, which, I mean, they do look somewhat similar. I wouldn't say they're as close as some of the ones that Anthony Perrot found, some of the petroglyphs, um, but they're close. Um you know, Anthony Peratt's theory of the plasma discharges also says that they would resemble human with humans with bird heads and humanoid figures and stacks of rings and donut shapes and serpent shapes. So we got lots of symbology in ancient, you know, hieroglyphs and ancient times of serpents and snakes. We also have lots of, you know, you think of ancient Egypt um, and even ancient Sumerians. Uh, they have the uh, bird headed gods, you know. You know, in Sumer, uh, you know the Sumerians had the Apkalu, um, and then ancient Egypt. You know, you've got like Thoth, who's got an ibis head. You know, and you've got all these different gods that have these bird heads. Uh, Horus has the head of a falcon. You know, um, right, right. So, like, where did those come from? You know, and like. You know, I don't I think, think people I, are just making up some stories. Well, yeah, yeah. So, birds. so like main mainstream, I think academics and archaeologists will say, well, we were just anthropomorphizing, you know, the situation. But I don't know. I mean, this this brings up an interesting point. If something weird was happening in the sky, um, creating all these weird things. I mean, look at that one image at the top, all the way to the right. You know, there's like a bird on top of what would be like a head. You know, like that's pretty weird. Sorry, it looks like my uh, my portrait. <laughs> <Caca>. uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it brings it brings up an interesting point. Like maybe there was a you know an, a more ancient tradition that saw these celestial events or experienced these things and then you know passed down the information. Right. But if they did witness them, the information they passed down might have been concocted because they really didn't understand them. If we witnessed something like we, the the Northern Lights the other day, we we knew they were coming. We were all prepared for them. We watched them. We thought they were cool. But if that happened 200 years or even 100 years ago, you see that? Well, probably maybe more like 200. You might think they're gods or you might have you have you have you have no clue what the hell that that, that is out there i mean i think you'd have to go even further back than that but yeah i mean i get what you're right. saying um <laughs> well no i mean because astronomical and celestial events i mean probably are a great explanation for a lot of things in ancient times you know because like mm -hmm. before we knew it was possible or kind of what was going on to even get off this planet like what's beyond it what's a star you know think about looking up in the sky and not knowing anything about anything just that they're they're just stars you know like what is yeah. what is a star they don't know what that you know like you know maybe they did you know maybe well, they I was, I, I was saying that because like i think it was frederick Douglass or i don't know some slave was he was waiting to revolt like these his, his owners did all these terrible things to him and his wife and stuff and this guy was just he was waiting to fucking oh sorry he was waiting to lose it and uh he he saw uh, an eclipse. Like he kept praying to the praying to God. He was obviously very you know Christian and stuff. Praying to God, praying to God. He said, "I'm waiting for a sign. Send me a sign, Lord." And then he saw an eclipse, and he saw he thought that was a sign for him to 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 revolt and start this slave revolution. So yeah, I mean it's, it's weird, you know, because he didn't know he didn't know if it was you know in our day day and age you see that same thing. It's not going to be a sign from the heavens. It's just going to be another eclipse because that's what happens out there. 
Yeah, I mean, it's weird that we go in these cycles too where it's like certain parts in the Middle Ages, people were so crude and so dumb, you know? But then you go back to the Greeks way further back than that and ancient Egyptians and all this. I mean, Thales, um, who's a pre-Socratic Greek scientist, philosopher, um, founder of the Ionian school, um, he predicted a solar eclipse in 585 BC, you know? And there's Mm -hmm. a lot of ancient Middle Eastern... Uh, philosophers and mathematicians and Hindu philosophers, mathematicians that were also able to do a lot of that stuff back then. Um, And then, you know, that's why they, you know, they have the yuga cycles where there's like the gold age, the silver age, the bronze age. Right, right. It keeps, and then it it switches back. And then we've got these periods of like dark ages where people are just morons and, and, and very materialistic or don't care about stuff, you know? So, um, it's interesting and stuff does swing back around and um, I think we're in a weird time right now where there are some people looking for answers and truth and there are some people willing to just believe anything and there are people that just don't care about any of that and just want to go about their day. Um, so let's go to the uh, the next one here. All right, so this is more of the uh, st- the Anthony Peratt stick men found uh, on the left there at the top. That's the plasma um, discharge that was recorded, and then it's compared to the stick men plasma found. Plasma discharge, that's a good band name. Yeah, and you're thinking about it in a sick way because I know you and you're a sick man. <laughs> no, I just like um, the word plasma is a cool word, and then discharge is just interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, you have the uh, you know the, the one from Arizona, the one from Armenia, uh, Guyana, Spain, you know Arab Emirates, yeah, Italy. The picture on the right of that is found in Hawaii, which obviously Hawaii is part of Polynesia and not that far from uh, Easter Island. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's not too far off from there. And the one below that is from Arizona. Um, So, yeah, I mean, look, it's pretty compelling in terms of similarities you know at oh, all yeah, yeah the other explanation is it could just be primitive drawings you know like that's what they were just able to carve you know they weren't able to carve anything more in depth or better than that that's another True. possibility but, but what, I, are these, what are these what are these nipples why do they all have yeah these nipples? well they, maybe they are nipples maybe they're represented you know Bir- birth or the cycle of life i don't think they are either but i don't yeah. think these guys these draw these these artists were that poor yeah, I don't think so they either. Have better skills than I'm just pointing out it is a possibility, but I do think that there's something weird about these dots on each side. Yeah, um, if they were if they were nipples, look at the one in the, the Armenian one that's down by the the hip. <laughs> and this the, the 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 Spanish one, the one from Spain's pretty low too, like Yeah. You got to get up pretty early in the morning to deal with those. <laughs> I'm telling you it's the transfer of life think, to energy. I'm yeah. going with that theory. I like it. It's 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 yeah, a good f- one. Okay. All right, so this is um, some uh, some birdmen from the uh, Tang- Tangata <laughs> Manu or the birdman. Not Michael Keaton. Let's make that clear. <laughs> the birdman cult from Easter Island. So these bird these birds are carved on the back of uh, a moai. Um, I'm not certain, but it looks like one that was carved out of red scoria. Um, as you can see, they have a pretty distinct features. They are part bird, part man, um, uh-huh. and they are found. And that bird face is pretty recognizable. You've seen everybody's seen that. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah, I mean it's 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 a pretty generic bird, you know. No, with just the the look of it. Right. The way the beak is cut, the big eye. Right. Like I, I don't know if it's something deep down in the subconscious, but I've seen that before and i can't put my finger on it yeah i mean it's looks like you know toucan sam possibly you know it could be found on a a cereal box no but uh yeah so that's you know let me go to the one here so that's the correlation um that dr shock makes between gobekli tepe and um easter island if you go to gobekli tepe on uh, T pillar, um, on the T pillar or pillar forty three, or also known as the Vulture Stone, um, 
you know, you have the um, similar, I mean, I wouldn't say they're the exact same, but if you can see there, it's kind of hard to see, but um, those bird heads are kind of similar looking. Um, So he makes, that's one of the main connections that he makes. Those Uh, other ones are a little more uh, vulture-esque. They have more of a rounded snout. Right, right. But that might just be because of the area they are. That that could be too. Um, but, I mean, that would be the the connection, though, would be um, this, uh, the similarities between the two were, were these people, because, you know, there's weird uh, Australian symbology found on some of the T-pillars that, you know, I think there's a couple pictures and memes going around with um, an Aborigine with the symbol you know, painted on his chest. That's that same exact symbol is found on one of the T pillars at Gobekli Tepe. Uh Um, and, uh, so, I mean, if you look at Australia, um, you know, it's not that far from Easter Island in, in the scheme of things compared to other places. So, you know, Australia, we know Australia Pithecus and, um, Australia could have been some like main hub where a lot of people were coming out of, you know, um, back yeah then. yeah for sure i ex- see what i see in that uh go back like tepe pillar up on top oh yeah the ancient we hand there ladies and gentlemen we'll do another one on that but the ancient ha- handbags um and um yeah, i don't know di- if i want to do another episode everybody was getting on our case because we made a couple of jokes during the cast it's like yeah we're, we're everything isn't got to be so serious we're talking about ancient handbags no one knows what they are do you remember that <laughs> yeah I think Relax, they're, people. I think they're we, getting we incorporate a little bit of jokes into this to lighten the mood. I, I mean, think they were getting mad because we were swearing a lot, and making a ton of jokes. But yeah, okay, I mean, I get, well, what, I get what you're saying. But so yeah, so I mean, that's why most people point to the Vulture Stone or Pillar Forty Three because it has so many weird. You know, it's got the the birds and the vultures, but it's also you know Graham Hancock speculates it has something to do with you know some image or diagram of a celestial body coming down, possibly what happened, what happened during the younger Dryas, you know, event that, you know, whether it be an asteroid or a comet. Um, And then he also has speculated that the ancient handbags on top could have been possibly used for carrying psychedelics, you know, something along those lines, which would equate to knowledge. Um, I mean, because whether you like it yeah, or not, getting outside the box. anybody that's done psychedelics, you come out of that, that experience wanting to be, well, for most people, some people have issues, some people get, you know, you know, anybody that has psychological issues like uh, schizophrenia mm-hmm. or anything like that shouldn't dabble in those arts. But um, most people that have psychedelic experiences come out of it. You like want to become like when any time I've ever tripped and came out of it, it made me like look at my life like I got to get this done I got to get this done I got to get myself in gear I want to be a better person I want to improve my life by doing this this you know you know yeah, it gave you a little perspective yeah and you don't want to do it again for a while so I mean that's I think the true right. ha- ha- hallmark of having a, a a real psychedelic experience is you know and not really mic- yeah, it's, mic- well, it's micro not dosing I mean in the first place either yeah I mean well that's a whole nother episode and topic but um so well, you're yeah, going down that path, my friend. Well, I just you was. Don't, you don't. I was just talking about Graham Hancock's theory about the handbags being possibly used for carrying psychedelics, or maybe the seeds for certain psychedelic plants, or something along those lines. All right, so we'll move on to the next one. Go back to Tepe, man. There's so many mysteries there. Oops, sorry. But you know what? It, it, it could just be some artist trying to do like an abstract. And when we're sitting here for hundreds of years studying these things, thinking they're going to give us the world's greatest meanings, might have been just some David Lynch type, right? Making something cool, giving up, you know, making a little art piece about him being scared of being a father, right? Who knows? So this is um, Arango. Um, they don't really know exactly what these structures were used for um it's almost hobbit town ask yeah but it's weird um like those those openings that you see there 
Um, I think they found like bones in some of them. Um, some of them <laughs> it's, have. It's very Hobbit Town. Man. This area was used uh, during the the Birdman cult era of the island. Um, of course it was. And um, there's also I I don't have a picture of it, but there's a cave off the coast of one of the parts of Easter Island where there's suggestions of cannibalism that happened um, too. So that's that's another one of the alternative theories that people were going crazy on the island, possibly from a scarcity of resources. So, right. I think so, we'll think about it. It must have happened. Some of the if people you the resources. Right. Some of the people may have resorted to cannibalism or something along those lines. Um, but yeah, there is a cave. That I don't. I don't have a picture of it, but you can look it up. You don't have any pictures of the interior of these joints. I, yeah, I don't have any pictures of people eating other people. In, no, no, no. But um, so I'm saying inside these little these little houses, I'd like to. Is it just like? No, I don't have an mud? image. Yeah, I think they're just covered. Again, I don't even think that they're used for living, and they possibly could have been maybe some oh, sort of yeah, storage. Maybe people were storing. Grains, yeah, bones. crops, <laughs> yeah, maybe. Uh, kill, maybe they were fire. Yeah, I have no idea um, on that one. But uh, well, if anybody knows or has an idea, leave us a comment below. Right. We're always up to new suggestions, and we like to get the uh, the audience involved as much as possible. So that brings us to the basalt moai. So we have there's moai that are carved from red scoria. There's moai carved from volcanic tuff. All the ones that are called, uh, carved from vol volcanic tuff come from the Ranu Raraku uh, quarry, uh, which we still have found evidence of um, the Moai still being embedded into the side of the uh, the volcanic rock. Um, uh -huh. But some of the earliest Moai were carved out of hard basalt. Now, that is important because no basalt quarries have been found on the island, according to Dr. Robert Schock, um, who's done extensive research on the island i believe he was even married on the island um and um, he really just loves the island yeah um but i mean it's 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 a cool place i mean i've never been there but from the pictures it looked like it'd be pretty cool yeah to, i'm sure there's a, a particular feeling there too you know when you yeah. go there you yeah. probably feel some weird vibes interesting good or bad interesting energy interesting uh, uh -huh. i mean if you're a photographer it's probably paradise yeah, um, that one with the stars is a phenomenal shot. Yeah. Um, so there have been no basalt, hard basalt quarries found uh, uh, on the island. So, um, you know, you can find, I think, some of the basalt moai in the, there's a, uh, I don't know if it's the museum in London, I believe. Um, but uh, so during a dive off the coast of Easter Island in the 1970s, Jacques Cousteau found slots cut out of hard stone which kind of look like windows. Um, and there's been theories suggesting that maybe those are the missing basalt, you know, blocks cut from that, which would have suggested an or, you know, back to Robert Schock's uh, suggestion of an older origin date of construction, maybe pre, you know, younger Dryas era when the, the, uh, the water levels were lower, maybe they were able to quarry some, you know, um, some of the basalt from there. Maybe they weird. You know, I would think that it would be pretty hard to quarry it underwater. I'm not saying it's impossible. I mean, who knows what they were capable of doing, but it just seems see, like a major pain in the booty. Yeah. So, I mean, the other explanation could be maybe basalt blocks were brought there, but I, that would be crazy. I think they'd be even crazier. So, um, yeah, so that's one of the anomalies with that, uh, these basalt moai, is that there's no actual basalt quarries anywhere that they found. So uh, That's um, a major problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's one of the bigger mysteries um, and anomalies that uh, that's out there. Um, Dr. Robert Schock also points to um, the walls, the sea walls found there. That's um, I believe that's Ahu Tahai. Um, but uh, the seawalls around some of these uh, Ahu and other parts of the island kind of resemble um, Incan structures like Saxe uh, Woman. And, um, you know, there's some other statues found in South America that look kind of similar to some of the Moai. Um, with like the Is hand. that a painting or a picture? That's unreal. That's a picture. Wow. Um, 
so yeah, so there's he thinks that there's a correlation between the seawalls and some of the South American building techniques and structures and stuff like that. So um, that's kind of an interesting aspect too, because like we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. we talked about earlier in the episode how you know Thor Heyerdahl believed that the original people of Easter Island were probably from you know South America, like Peru or Chile, somewhere around there. Um, yeah, so I mean, look. I mean, if you're looking at, you can look up Saxe Woman. Um, it's not Saxe Woman. It's dude. not that close. I mean, the only thing you could say is you're just making this stuff up, man. Come on. the The only thing you could say is is that some of the walls, you know, resemble in the way that the stone kind of falls into place. Um, but I don't think that Easter Island. It looks like the the sea walls and the stone walls don't look as perfect. Um, you know, they're a little more rugged, for and, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, in Sex and Woman, everything's so smooth and, and perfectly formed together, you know, almost like they were melted into place or um, something along those lines. Um, so, yeah, that was just another part of that. This is my own theory, and I'm going to throw hey. this out there. And I actually haven't seen this anywhere else. Um, is this the final segment with Michael? No, there might be a couple uh, more. I don't remember. Oh, okay. I thought this was like the, the, the Jerry Springer show when he would talk right to the camera and give, no. him, so, give two cents. So every other part of the world um, in ancient times, there's some sort of connection to psychedelic or psychoactive plants, you know, fungus, whatever. Um, and I was looking at the island from that standpoint, like what – you know, I always think too, like when I think about ancient civilizations, mythology, where did, did they just make it up? Um, was it a hallucination? Was it a psychedelic experience? Was it a dream? Was it a lucid dream? Like what was going on um, back then? Um, and so I looked at the island from the standpoint of psychedelics because I looked up Easter Island and psychedelics and really nothing came up. So I started to do a little bit digging and making connections. Uh, and I actually found a couple things. So um, DMT and, and uh, ancient uh, psychedelic use on Easter Island, there might have been some potential there. Uh, as you can see, Chile, um, you know, off the coast of Easter Island there, it's 2,300 miles, so it's pretty far. But the migratory seabirds before people got to Easter Island, they carry, you know, seeds and, you know, who knows what, what can get blown across the ocean and through the sea, you know, into the seas and what seeds get carried onto shore and that kind of stuff. Uh, but it's possible, you know, some bird ate some acacia seeds or something along those lines in uh, South America and it could have just, you know, took a dump on Easter Island. Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. But... So this is actually an acacia tree that's found on Easter Island. It's called Acacia Cavern. Um, it there's not a ton of research on it, but m most acacia of you know most of the acacia variety does contain DMT, usually in the root and the bark. Um, this specific tree. Now I don't know if this was brought here later. If this had always been there, we know they deforested the whole island, but that doesn't mean that, you know, these things weren't native to there before. Um, but, and this strain is actually found on mainland Chile and South America and uh, Peru and other parts of South America. Um, you know, this specific strain, not that much is known. There's a whole uh, part uh, on Wikipedia, if you look up Acacia and DMT, where they talk about the known acacia varieties that have been, um, you know, they've broken them down and, and uh, either extracted or they know it does have psychoactive active components. It's not a lot to know about this species other than um, its leaves, sometimes mixed with tobacco and some other type of seeds, uh, produce some psycho, uh, psychoactive hallucinogenic effects. So maybe in ancient times you know, the Rapa Nui or whoever was on the island, uh, South Americans. South Americans probably had knowledge of this stuff. Um, we know they just found a shaman's pouch, which was made out of a fox snout um, from, I think it was 1000 AD, which would have been mainstream's timeline dating of uh, Easter Island when the Rapa, uh, 
roughly when the Rapa Nui people got there. Uh, they found the shaman's pouch that contained, um, you know, I think they, what did they find? Uh, Bufatinine. Uh, oh, cocaine, BZ. Y- yeah. Uh, DMT. Yep, DMT, harmine, you know, the MAOI inhibitor, and uh, psilocin. So it was basically kind of like an ayahuasca. This guy, oh, this guy was ready for a good weekend. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you know, basically, you know, when you do, when you ingest DMT, you also need the MAOI inhibitor. Right, um, right. Wow, you, that's crazy. When you smoke it, you have to smoke more of a pure version of it to get the effects. Um, but, yeah, so they found this shaman's pouch. So we do know that there were people carrying around um, psychedelics Incredible. back then. You know, so. Yeah, and, and if, cocaine. So if you believe that some of the people could have gotten to Easter Island from South America, it's not that impossible that those people would have had a rich tradition in use of psychedelics. Um you know, mm-hmm. you know, understanding of the shamanic culture. Um, so yeah, I mean, well, I'm good, good I, sleuthing on that one. Well, I'm I just, like you know, I'm just basically suggesting that some of the cults on Easter Island and some of the history, you know, maybe I don't. Who knows exactly what the Moai were conceptualized for, you know, or the mythology behind it or whatever. But you know, maybe it was a dmt trip maybe it was some sort of dream you know who knows maybe it was just them you know that that was their version of science back then was coming up with these you know these mythologies or these stories to explain natural occurrences yeah they could have just been massive metaphors yeah the other Another thing beautiful picture though that's, that's so i can't incredible. pronounce that word i'm not even going to try um but it's also it's known as um, hallucinogenic fish inebriation. So most people don't think about this, but there's certain places in the world like Reunion Island, um, and other parts of the Caribbean, um, places off the coast of Africa, and then also like Hawaii and other parts of Polynesia, where some of the tropical reef fish uh, will eat. Uh, macro algae, green algae, and even some poisonous corals. Um, and then somehow it gets like um, embedded into their skin or filtrates through their skin. Um, and then when people catch them and eat them, they have these hallucinogenic um, or these, you know, psychedelic experiences. Um, mm-hmm. There was an episode of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia where I believe he goes to one of these islands in the Caribbean, I believe, or I forget where it was, um, and he eats some of these fish. Like, the fish heads, I guess, are what contain a lot of these toxins, but um, it's basically not a pleasant... Yeah, it's probably in their brain or something. But it's not a pleasant hallucinogenic experience. Like, people don't... <laughs> most people that do it aren't like, oh, yeah, let's get more of those fish heads, you know? It's it's let's one of those... go fishing! It's It almost seems like it creates, like, a sleep paralysis state. So it's not, like, um, pleasant, usually. It's, it's more, you know, some people have other, you know, intest, you know, intestinal issues going on while that's happening, you know, stomach aches, that kind of stuff. Some people, yeah. you know... It doesn't sound like it's for me, my friend. <laughs> Some people have these intense, intense, you know, dreams. Um, you know, my theory was, too, when the Rapa Nui ran out of, you know, palm palm wood to build the canoes, deep sea fish, etc., they were, were most likely resorted to consuming some of these shallow reef fish, you know, because you're not going to be able to go because you can dive off the coast a little bit, you know, catch some of these fish. Um, and there are fish found in that area of the world that do um that are known as hallucinogenic fish um so just another theory that you know when push comes to shove and your main source of you know tuna or whatever your deep porpoise whatever your deep sea fishing for isn't available anymore you'll go to the next best thing and that's these fish which you know actually if you go back to the origin story from ahu akivi um with the guy Haumaka that had the dream of Easter Island. Um, and then the King Hotu Matua sends the seven scouts. The dream that that guy was having could have been from eating some of these hallucinogenic fish, just speculation, just throwing that out there. I don't know. I have no idea, but I think it's a possibility. Um, the hallucinogenic fish found to the left there in the black and white photo, 
uh, is found in Hawaii and some of the Pacific Islands. It's also known as the chief of ghosts. So yeah, pe- he looks like a real nasty bugger. <laughs> so when people eat that, you know, they're going to have a real wild ride and it's pro- <laughs> it's pr- you're probably going to be seeing ancestors and ghosts if that's you the case. You turn into a fish and live um, life for a, like an hour. Yeah, so these are just some of my theories on some, you know, because they know on Easter Island there was all these cults and some people went crazy and things were happening. This is mm-hmm. just my little uh, spiel and, and, and deep dive into this and what I think could have caused some of those things to occur. Um, you know, like I said, both of them, you know, could be correlated to a reduction in, in natural resources. So let's say they chop down all the normal palm trees. Um, let's say there's some of those acacia trees left, you know, maybe they're making root stew or root bark or, you know, maybe, you know, I, I, I don't know, but I'm just saying like when you're reduced to nothing, you start to, to venture out, you know, some of these eating some of these reef fish or trying plants, you know, that maybe you wouldn't have tried before that kind of stuff. So that's just a theory I found. So there's different moai um, found all over the island. It's not just, and there's not tons of them, but um, most of the moai, you know, you've seen in the early pictures that I pulled up. Those are the ones that you see with the the high, narrow faces um, with, the, you know, the big nose kind of, you know, that standing over, you know, the ahu. Um, this one's called tukuturi. Uh, which means kneeling moai. Uh, this moai is the only moai that I know of. I, I'm pretty sure it's the only one on the island that is kneeling, which they don't know specifically why. Um, it has a rounded beard. I'm sorry, a rounded head. Uh, most of the moai have that more of like that block shape head. Um, it also has a beard, as you can see there, that little beard under the chinny chin chin. Um, yeah, he's, a very, he's a hipster. Yeah, uh, he needs one of those hats to get that man bun <laughs> going. Um, but uh, he's also sta- him a beret, slap he's, him in the cheek. <laughs> he's also uh, found staring up at the stars. Um, he's carved from red scoria. Again, most of the other moai um, were carved from uh, the volcanic tuff. Um, he's found near Rano Raraku quarry, which was more where all the volcanic tough moai were carved from. Um, some believe that this moai is tied to the Tangata Manu or the Birdman cult. So, like I said, there's two different eras. There was the era of the moai cult, which were the people that were building all the original moai. Um, and then you have the island descending into chaos, maybe from lack of resources, maybe from infighting maybe from you know, like we said even possible cannibalism happening some crazy stuff um so they believe that this moai was from a later possible date here is a moai okay so what as you can see there some of the moai that you see sticking out of the ground by ranu raraku <coughs> some people think they're just heads right. but all these moai also have bodies and as you can see if you go down there yeah, wasn't that just recently when they uncovered a bunch? Yeah, so there's those long, skinny, thin fingers that wrap around the bottom of the belly there at the bottom that you can also find that um, in Gobekli Tepe, too. So that was, like, one of the other correlating factors for Doc. Man, that'd be sweet to get one of those for your backyard. <laughs> it's, like, 33 feet, something ridiculous. That thing's probably priced. Like, yeah, you go, how much is this? Um, yeah, I think the big the biggest one on the islands, El Gigante or something like that, is his name, and it's like thirty three feet high. I mean, that that's pretty big. Um, How big? Thirty three feet, I think. Okay, okay, yeah, that that one right there is, dude. Look at that. That lady is probably six feet. Yeah, well, not six feet, but probably, that guy's yeah. probably five in between five and six feet. Right. Look at that one, two. Yeah, I guess that thing's probably 25, 30 feet. So that they don't know how these moais got buried so deep either. That was like one of the... So we know, like I said before, Great I think flood. Na- na- 1960 was the largest earthquake ever recorded in um, Chile, uh, which caused a tsunami, which knocked off 
Um, all the Moai off Ahu Tongariki, which mm-hmm. has the most Moai on it uh, in Easter Island. Maybe that tsunami pushed all that, you know, um, sediment over some of the Moai. I don't know. Um, others speculate that once the island was deforested, so once they cut down all the palm trees and everything, there were no roots uh, or root systems left in the sediment, which crea- created like landslides and, and different, you know, um, different, you know, uh, topsoil configuration things happening. Um, yeah, I mean, Dr. Shock points to the fact that this is evidence that you don't just get that kind of, um, you know, layers of sediment from, you know, a couple hundred years or a thousand years of normal, uh, uh, you know, weathering. That's something that have, takes a lot longer. So that's why he thinks that it dates back to, you know, back near the younger Dryas era, which is, like I said, I don't necessarily believe that, but I mean, wh- what do we know? You know, we don't know. We, we know, know until we don't know. Well, I mean, okay. So we know Gobekli Tepe is that old. Obviously it's been radiocarbon dated 9,700 you know, BC, um, uh, Easter Island, like I said, you know, three to 400 AD, 1200, if you're being gener, you know, 1200, if you're, um, one of the mainstream people. So, I mean, that, that's, that's a big difference in time. That's almost 10,000 years difference. Um, so you were asking last time about the archaeoastronomy aspect of the Island. Um, I did a lot of research, I couldn't find anything concrete or anything um, that was like, yes, these correlate to these constellations or that's what this is. Or, you know, like you find with some of the pyramids, there's exact things or some of the observatories found in other ancient civilization and megalithic structures. We know there's a correlation to solstices and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. There was no definite thing, but I did find a Harvard um, research uh, study paper that uh, I'll put the link down below after the episode too so people can check it out um, where they believe that some of the Ahus may have been aligned or you know coordinated with some of the summer and winter solstices um, they also yeah, be- after seeing the sink that how far they sunk right. they definitely could have been in who knows God knows where right they also believe that uh, Ahu Akivi, um, you know, the, the seven that face outward. Um, yeah. They believe that the three stars of Orion's belt, um, may they may have been facing the three stars of Orion's belt when they were first built. So, um, you know, how Graham Hancock, Robert Bavall, they, you know, coordinate the three pyramids of Giza to the three stars of Orion's belt. Also the the same thing in uh, Teotihuacan uh, and same thing with other parts of the world. Um, They're suggesting that possibly the, uh, at Avu Ahu Akivi that those um, seven Moai were facing out towards Orion's belt, but that's still kind of speculation too. So, you know, the, the paper, while it does do some things that I found, it, it doesn't really explain a whole lot. So I think there needs to be more research into that. Um, we do know that there's, you know, if they were able to align megalithic structures, you know, 3,000, 2,500 BC, or let's just say for sure that Gobekli Tepe has astronomical um, connections, then, I mean, that's 9,700 BC. I see no reason why there's not some correlation between the Moai, but the Moai represent the deified ancestors. So while we give the other megalithic structures importance because of their connection to the stars, um, it seems like Easter Island's megalithic structures are more um, associated with the the legends and the mythology. So I don't know. Yeah, all mainstream thinks that uh, all the the pyramids are you know tombs for for their fallen. Well, so. you're right. You're right. But that doesn't mean that there's not temples. I mean, there's ancient temples that we know obser- right. observe. But have they solstice. not even found anybody in one of those pyramids? Yeah, I mean, 
Khufu's body has never been found. None of none of the pyramids they've ever found. Um, great, great theory. Mummies. So, so that was that. Except for the movie The Mummy. Yeah, with Brendan Fraser. Your favorite movie ever, <laughs> and your favorite actor. <laughs> yes, sir. All right, so this brings us to, I think, probably the craziest one. Um, yeah, tickle my fancy here. Let's just point this out first. I do believe in UFOs. They are real. We have the Tic Tac video, the Gimbal video, and the Go Fast video. Um, our Navy pilots are seeing things. I do believe that there are anomalous things in our skies, whether they be our own advanced technologies, advanced technologies from different countries, or possibly even extra you know, terrestrial you know, drones or possibly even containing extraterrestrials. I don't know. Uh, so right. I, I, I do believe that that does exist. But let's get to the other aspect of this, which some people think that aliens built all the megalithic structures or some of the megalithic structures or a few yeah, of them, whatever. So it's, you know, the ancient astronaut or ancient alien theories, um, you know, you, you watch ancient aliens and they suggest that aliens built these things. Well, right. I mean, my the question. Aliens built uh, Chicago, New York, <laughs> but for, for, L.A. Forget about that. My problem. No, I can't forget about that. What do you mean, forget about that? Humans build some crazy shit. Yeah. So why can't you just believe? Why can't so they can't build these these stone structures? We do, and we did. But the problem I have is, if you're an alien and you have anti gravity technology, or if you have faster than or, than the speed of light technology, and you can get here from another galaxy, another planet, another star system, whatever. If you can get here, you're going to use stone tools, you know, <laughs> obsidian axes, yeah. and you're going like to carve the most crude, rude, you know, <laughs> pre-chewed food dude. <laughs> you're going to you're going to carve these crude, you know, and look. Right. For what we know about like they're evol- amazing for stone people, they're they're, they're turds for uh intergalactic a, travelers. Yeah, if you're if you're traveling to distant star systems, you're not going to build something out of stone, and if you do, it's going to be amazing. It's going to look like a 3D printer built it. You know, well, you don't know though. We still do puzzles. We do stuff to challenge us. So right, right, again. right. But I'm just saying, like, t- to you're think you're also being very Earth biased too. You know, you don't know what these other beings are. That's they may tr- never have seen stone. That's so. true, but w- still, that, that but that doesn't explain. No, I'm on I'm on board with you. I'm that doesn't explain the human point. aspect of it, which we, we <laughs> you know, like, yeah. uh, if you if you want to make it a stretch, like these people will say, oh well, humans were genetically altered, okay, or humans, um, they had divine inspiration. Like I said, I I had a whole part about the psychedelics and how possibly some of the mythology or cults were inspired by psychedelic use. It's not impossible that they saw some crazy stuff in the sky and they're like, oh, let's create a cult around that. Or, oh, oh yeah, you know, yeah, like, I'm sure it's happened before and it'll happen again. And, and that's not impossible, that aspect of it. But, like, you know, the whole, oh, the UFOs came and they moved them or they walked, they, you know, like the, the legend goes that the Moai walked to their positions on the Ahu. They've proven that you can use two ropes pulled from each side to you right. know simulate they call it the wibble wobble yeah to simulate a walk so we know that that's possible that humans can do that so again why would aliens you know carve come down and use cr- crude stone tools and carve these uh, megalithic structures when they have all the technology in the world it just doesn't make any sense this last point you said, why is there no evidence of advanced technology? But there, we did find some gears and stuff that have no explanation I'm talking, for the time. I'm talking about specifically on right, Easter you're Island. you're talking about lasers and stuff. But there are, there are still anomalies with some of the megalithic structures. There are machine tooling marks on some things. There are, you know, like in ancient Egypt and pottery and different things and uh, weird, you know, the Serapium's got a lot of weird stuff, you know. Yeah. We it, don't... It, I think a lot of them do represent early man, though. Like, when you, if you think of, uh, you take a child's painting, you know, yeah. it might not be, you can kind of see what it's resembling, but the artwork isn't going to be phenomenal. That's kind of like what these structures are. It definitely represents early man. Right. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think aliens really have But to say, to like, a, a UFO came down and, like, carved this thing out of rock or dropped it into place or you know what here's Uh here's the thing too is i've said this before and i'll say it again i think ancient alien shows interesting 
the thing that kills me about the show is when they start saying aliens built this and aliens built that and no if you want to theorize about life in the universe or life in the fast lane different theories or start talking about like scientific aspects of it or like like i said the modern day stuff that we're experiencing now where there's anomalous things in the sky that both pilots and radar systems are catching that our own government's releasing um so if you're paying attention to that there are weird things but to say that those things are building megalithic structures, then how come they haven't built anything new? You know, like how come the yeah. how come there's not there's no new Stonehenge? You know, and like we know there is there like are you cities. pointed out. Well, cities are built by humans. We humans build buildings. That's what we do. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like that's you can't make that mistake because it's just not logical. There's no logic in that aspect of it. Um, so. That's just my little rant about that, but but yeah. So you want to love wa- your I love your stone cold points here. You want to you want to watch some ancient- people think it's aliens. <laughs> you want to watch some people built it. I think it's ancestors. <laughs> you you want to watch ancient aliens and be entertained and look at cool megalithic structures. I'm all with you on that. You want to yeah, start. You don't have to. You don't have to watch ancient aliens to watch that. You can pull that stuff up on YouTube. I'm sure. You could, but there's not that much stuff and. I don't want to hear that annoying. There's, yeah, there's, there's not that. Ma- there's not as many things on. Like for instance, most people know about Gobekli Tepe because of ancient yeah, aliens. Right. Like I would say, more people know about Gobekli Tepe because of ancient aliens than non-ancient aliens. Now they think that maybe aliens built it, which I don't agree with at all. But that's a whole different story. I'm just saying it brings archaeological and megalithic structures and different things into public light that weren't there before. And then maybe people will see that and do a little bit of their own research. The the whole point of this from part one, how we did mainstream and academic theories to part two. Now we're talking about alternative and mysteries and stuff is to put all the information out there and let people decide what's real, what's real to them. What, what do they find objective about, you know, both these things, you know, and I, I, our show is predicated on the fact that there are still real mysteries out there in life. However, do your research because, you know, you can't watch a show on History Channel and believe everything they say and then take that as gospel. You know, you need to do a little bit of your own research. So, yeah. You got to watch those shows and believe not, not believe everything they so say. So, here's an, maybe believe in one thing they say. So, here's Ranu Raraku again. So, again, this is just an example. Humans used, you know, hand tools, uh, probably maybe basalt, hand, hand stone, or, you know, obsidian axes, stuff like that to carve these uh, moai out of the side of the volcanic uh, tough quarry. Um, now, again, that's why it's just impossible that aliens would do such things. It's just ludicrous. <laughs> Here's a... a Unless um, aliens are teenagers coming down to Earth to mess with the people here. No. And they're just getting off. No, that's not happening. They're, ha- they're hammered. They're these hammered organisms making crude dark, crude drawings in, the, in the, the stone. Nope, not happening. So this is just a further back pick of uh, Ranu Raraku, so you can see kind of how big that uh, volcanic quarry is. Um, there's a lot of those moai. As you can see, you can't see the... Um, the uh, bottom of those like how we had the picture before where they dug out the whole moai and it was very tall compared to what just the little head that you see poking out yeah uh here's another pic from ranu raku um you know it's kind of got that pink floyd division bell vibe on this one well you don't have to rifle through all these maybe save another one for part three there is no save part three. Oh, uh, well not now <laughs> There will never be part three. <laughs> um, the third movie always sucks. There's just a few more images here. We saw that in the first one. That's an old school. Yeah. Oh, boy. And at the top there in the middle, that's Ahu Tangariki. There's Ahu Tangariki as well. Um, that's the Ahu, all those Moai right there pictured were knocked over by the tsunami, um, from the, uh, 
the largest earthquake ever recorded in 1960 in Chile. Um, so they re-erected those and tried to uh, fix them up a little bit. Some of them were obviously messed up. Some of them have cracked heads and stuff. Yeah, imagine if you were the guy who cracked one of them. <laughs> There's a beautiful picture of the uh, the moon rising behind Ahu Tangariki. They're all beautiful pictures. Yeah. This is from what, Adobe Stock? Yeah. Man, this is they, dude, this, they get some good stuff in there, I'll yeah. tell you. This is the image of when, that's the Ahu Tangariki that we were just looking at, but this is when all of the Moai were toppled over from the tsunami. So you, so you can see they were all uh, knocked over. Well, that one picture with the moon, I wanted to comment over that. That's, that's got to be superimposed, man. It is. Yeah. It's superimposed, man. I saw a goat in the background, too. So uh, what would you think? you have any questions? you have any other of your own theories? No, or? it was nice. I learned a lot. I like the, sli- I like the new format. I think, uh, I think our listeners are digging the new format, too. We had a good turnout. We had some good uh, audience participation. I want to give everybody a shout-out. Thanks for joining us on this long Easter Island adventure. <laughs> yeah, again, the whole point of this part one, part two, part one was to take a look at the mainstream and academic theories on what happened and what was going on. Um, and this part two was to look at all the mysteries and the uh, alternative theories. I think... Um, like I said, in life, you know, there's there's still mystery out there. Um, the 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 gap or that the fringe might not be as big as some people would like or as plentiful as some people like. But there are stuff. There is things and new discoveries to be made. You just have to like do a little bit of your own research and um, get in there. And um, yeah, I mean, I just uh, I found some. No, I like I like this because we we, we you, you you bat you. Sorry, let me back up here. I'm getting very excited. I did did did. You stacked all the the facts, and then at the end you trickled in some of your own ideas. So it's it's nice because you can build up something, shoot it, shoot all the information that you know, and then let everybody make their own decisions. Yeah, again, I just I wanted I want that's how I want to do our episodes that we do like this. I want to just put all the information out there, whether it's mainstream or fringe. So it's out there and people can make educated decisions as opposed to watching some objective show or objective documentary or objective scientific paper where the whole point is to sway you to think in a certain way. I just want all the information out there so people can make their own educated decisions and guesses on what actually happened or, um, you know, stuff like that. I just don't think there's enough of that out there. I don't think people are getting the whole picture. I think that, when you go on YouTube, most channels have an agenda. When you go on to, um, you know, we watch TV, Ancient Aliens, or whatever it is, there's an agenda. Mm-hmm. There's an agenda, you know. So I just wanted to put all this stuff out there in, in a, um, you know, a way that people can look at pictures and diagrams and information, and uh, you know, take from take it take from it what they want. So, well said, Michael. Uh, everybody, <laughs> hit that like button comment below and uh i guess we'll talk to you next time yeah subscribe to our channel again help us grow by contributing two dollars a month at patreon.com slash mike and maurice uh you will gain access to exclusive interviews and videos we don't have anybody signed up yet i have stuff (laughs) i have stuff ready to roll for people that subscribe to our patreon if you become a patron of us i have stuff ready to roll but Currently, that means we, you're our biggest fan. We'll shower you with gifts. Current, and we will we will mention your name on the next episode. Um, also, visit our website at mikeandmauricemindescape.com. Uh, follow us on Instagram at instagram.com slash mike underscore n underscore maurice. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash mike escape. Uh, join our Facebook group, Mike and Maurice's Mind Escape. And uh, check out our other channel if you like short little videos called Ancient Secrets. And uh, that's yeah, it. We gotta get we gotta get these end titles zipped up, man. I'll little. do I'll do what I want. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Peace. Peace.